I got it in my notes. I was going to mention it. Glenn already has. We, uh, the Lord has blessed Mike uh, to be with us, and we're glad for that. Certainly under the circumstances that he has, that he's facing, uh, we're just grateful to have him uh, with us, uh, back up and running uh, among the saints, and he's banged up like uh, others, and, uh, but we're hopeful. And in light of that, uh, Paul discusses these type situations, I believe, uh, at the last part of chapter 15, and I'm going to take the liberty to do this, because what Paul has done is set the record straight, right, uh, regarding this uh, nonsense that some were saying that there was no resurrection of the dead. But he goes on to encourage Christians, and he tells them, uh, and I mean not just those at Corinth, right, all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, that would include you and I. That would even include us. But Paul exhorts, and if you'll notice, he says, but thanks be to God. And I mean amen to that, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what he has reference to is the fact that Jesus Christ has overcome death. He has overcome sin. And as a result of that, him being the first fruits, we have hope. See, we have hope that what we've done, that our obedience will not go unnoticed. And all of us, all that are here in these seats, all that are in every place, all Christians can take comfort, see, in the fact that we've been given the victory. Now, we're not in heaven yet. See, this, this victory is in promise, but it's the great hope, see, that guides our lives. It anchors us. See, it keeps us battling. It keeps us working hard in the kingdom. And he mentions that, see, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work. See, what we're to be doing is continuing in the work. That's why I'm glad to see Mike. That's why I'm glad to see all of you. That's why I'm glad to see any here that's suffering from day to day. That the task at hand, but it's because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have hope. We can count on us rising from the dead. See, that's our victory. And we'll get it one day if we're steadfast, if we're immovable, and if we'll keep on keeping on, keep on working in the kingdom. Christ tasted death, and God loosed, Acts 2, the pains of death by raising Him from the dead. This assures us, see, of a resurrection. Paul says He's the first fruits, and we're to come after those that are in Christ, see? He points this out in this chapter. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. And so we do have it, and Isaiah foretold of this great victory, death, he said, is swallowed up in victory. What's the point? Well, Jesus will come forth. See, death has a hold on us some. It has some pains. Christ loosed them. But death uh, has a hold on us. We're contained in it. But when he shows up, and all that are in the graves will hear his voice, we'll come forth. See? And he'll take death, and he'll take Hades, and he'll take them, and he'll cast them into the lake of fire. He'll burn them up. They've been enemies of man. See, God would 
seat him at his right hand till all his enemies are made his footstool. And so death will ultimately be defeated. See, O oh, death, where is your victory? Isaiah foretold, and then Paul would write, see, to the Corinthians and say, uh, for uh, this corruptible has put on incorruption. This is this death and the victory that we have in Christ. So when this corruptible, this flesh we have, Mike, has put on incorruption. See, when we get these wonderful, uh, I'm sure glorious bodies that we've been promised and assured of, and this mortal... This flesh has put on immortality, eternity, will be fashioned for eternity, then shall be brought to pass. See, what when Isaiah foretold, O death, where is your victory? That death, he says, is swallowed up in victory. He has reference to the day that you and I will be given these glorious bodies. See? And we have this in promise. We have this in action now because he really has already defeated death. He's already beat sin. Now death is the sting of sin. He says the sting of death is sin, but Christ beat it and overcome it. See? And thus he is right and adequate, the best of the best in terms of sacrifices that could be offered. See, he's defeated it. Now, therefore, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't let any person, and that's what he has warned in verse 33, be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Evil communications corrupts good morals. See, evil people, their influence will corrupt the good habits that we have in Christ. That's what was happening here. Paul says, awake, he says, see, wake out of sleep, awake to righteousness, and do not sin. Don't listen to them. Because if in fact there's no resurrection, then we might as well eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Say, what's the point in this battling? But what we can take hold of, and I want to encourage you, and uh, I want to, uh, there's a reason I'm uh, going back through this. So many are struggling right now, and we need to stay focused on the task at hand. See, no matter where we are in our lives, no matter what portion of health we have, see, no matter where we uh, the strength we have, it's weak, we may be frail, These, this uh, mortal, see this corruptible is certainly fading, but we have hope and we have been given the victory, see, over all these things and we need to keep that in mind, but he says knowing that your labor is not in vain, that it does count. I've mentioned this before. I've mentioned it in other churches. God, now I may not, your husband may not, the church may not remember all that you've done. They may not even care anymore. They might have at one time. They may even forget about it. They might treat you like you've never done anything for anybody. But I tell you who will remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God the Father. And that's what Paul is talking about, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. God won't forget. Now I might. I may not appreciate what you've done. I may not appreciate all your work. 
I, I imagine uh, the elders feel like that sometimes. Folks think y'all don't do nothing, do they? <laughs> it's not true. You may, they may not appreciate you like they should, but just remember that your service will not go unnoticed in Christ. That we must think like Paul and become persuaded and remember that he's able to keep what we've committed to him. And Paul says against that day. That's what he's talking about here. See, all these labors, they're again, we want God to remember them and we want him to bring up at the judgment the pies we baked. We do. Every pie, I'm telling you, you keep baking them because we, you want that to be there. You know how I know that? Because Jesus says that uh, the person that would give one of these little ones just a cup of cold water. Well, you, you think God ain't zeroed in on it? On what we do for others? What we do for Christians? When you get down to He'll bless you if you give him a, a cup of cold water. You think he'll forget? He will not. See, he's not like us now. We may forget, and others may not appreciate what you've done. They may not even remember <laughs> what all you've done. <laughs> but I just want to tell you you keep battling, keep fighting, keep working. Because he remembers all of it. Every act of kindness will be brought up. You can tell in Matthew 25, say, when did we see you in prison? When did we? When did we? When did we? When did we? Say, he says, when you helped others. When you did it to, when you helped Christians, you did it to me. So what's the message? See, keep battling. He'll remember. You've been given the victory. See, and when you come forth in that new body, see, we'll have a lot to look forward to. See, we'll meet him in the sky, meet him in the air. Just a glorious uh, awaiting for those of us that are steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Keep that in mind. He won't forget. And let me read one final verse where Paul told Timothy, for this reason, and I'm, uh, excuse me, I knew that wasn't it. I'm wanting what the Hebrew writer said. For God is not unjust, and this is Hebrews 6.10, to forget your work, that's what Paul's talking about, ain't it? See, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. See, even when we die, oh, we're going gonna, gonna to meet them works. When he shows back up and the books are open and all that we've done for him, Paul said he'll keep them against that day. See, and I take that to be the day of judgment. See, that them think they'll hold us up. We don't have to be scared. We don't have to dread death, see. We've been given the victory. Even in death, we're promised that just like the first fruits, that when he comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first. We'll meet him in the sky. I don't mean come from the grave first. I mean that they will rise first is the idea. But be that as it may, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, I wish we could every week <laughs> to keep us keeping on, remembering that God won't forget. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, I would like to read the first four verses. Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I've given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, 
storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come, and when I come, whomever you approve, by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it's fitting that I go also, they will go with me. This section of the Bible uh, is uh, just as important as what we just read about the resurrection of the dead. And here what we find is Paul giving the church at Corinth some uh, instructions. So he on something that he, as an apostle, wants them to do. Now what I hope to do, because there's a good bit, as you probably well know, and I know many of you know, that there's a good bit of controversy surrounding these particular verses. Uh, we don't have any here. We're sound and solid on the contribution here, but that's not the case everywhere. Uh, uh, just as recent as COVID, one of the problems that I had with churches that were not meeting is that they were not taking up a collection. I never understood that one second. It wasn't just simply the Lord's Supper. I'm wondering why in the world that even if you couldn't meet in public, why aren't you taking up a collection? Well, see, this lets me know, Brother Hall, that churches are struggling, see, they, they really struggling with way, way more, see, than just uh, uh, afraid of COVID. See, it's way more involved in this, see, than just not meeting to break bread up on the first day of the week. See, since when can we tear 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and the first four verses out of our Bibles? Don't we blame the Baptists for tearing parts out? Don't we blame uh, the denominations for tearing sections out of the Bible? And since when can we, as God's people, elders made many of these decisions. I know of a few churches just myself. I wrote for some of the saints at different groups to address these matters. See, since when can we tear this section out of the Bible? See. What I plan to do is to take each part of these four verses and address them. Like, for instance, today I'd like to cover uh, now concerning the collection. And then we'll look at for the saints. And that's what I mean. And I think what we'll find by this approach, uh, you test, there's no trickery involved. Uh, what uh, I believe causes some of the confusion, even among brethren, is that they come over and they get blinders on this section of the Bible. See? And it's called some, and here are some of the contentions. I don't hold these views, but here's what some, some contend that based on these verses, these first four verses here, churches today shouldn't take up a weekly collection because these verses specifically uh, mentions the churches of Galatia and the church at Corinth. We just read it, and that's, they write it. it this just mentions uh, the churches of Galatia, doesn't it? And it says, uh, he writing to the church at Corinth. And so they surmise from this that uh, we shouldn't take up a weekly collection day. That was just for Corinth and the churches of Galatia. And some contend that this specific collection uh, uh, today should be uh, that Christians ought to just keep it at home. 
because the instructions say that a person ought to lay by him in store, that they ought to store it up at the house. Some brethren even have contended. And some further argue uh, for churches only taking up the money as they need it. Because they point out, and Brother Hall and others have probably run across this. See, their, their thought is, now that was just a one-time uh, thing right there. They say, Paul wrote to Corinth and told them what to do, and that was it. Where in the world is the authority for churches today to be taking up a weekly collection? Now, I'd like to look as we talk as we discuss what the Bible actually says, I think I will address, and I certainly hope to, all of these, uh, what I understand to be false uh, understandings on, about this passage. For the record, let me state clearly that I hold the view, I believe that the scriptures teach that churches must not only are they authorized, but churches must take up a collection up on the first day of every week. Now that's what I believe. And if you have any questions about this collection, uh, if, and, or something in particular that you'd like me to address, uh, just let me know and we'll do our best to address it. Now, Paul says, now concerning the collection. Now, it's possible, and I, I believe Brother Hall holds this view, uh, and it's a good view, because it certainly well could be the case, might certainly be the case, uh, when Paul says now concerning the collection, that he's continuing uh, a uh, argumentation that he started back in chapter 7 at that section of the Bible where he states, now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, and then he starts naming these things. So he's now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me. And uh, he starts talking about, evidently, they had some questions, had written to Paul, if you would, about whether or not a person ought to get married. See, he addresses that out of the gate, see. And he talks about some other related matters about divorcing an unbelieving spouse. But then he comes over, and when he gets over to verse uh, chapter 8, excuse me, he says, now, concerning uh, things offered to idols. See, right after this little section of the Bible, just um, picture the Bible as it was originally written. No ch uh, chapter breaks. Uh, these aids that were men went in and put the verses and things for us, but just picture uh, a letter, and Paul says, now concerning the things that you wrote to me about, and then he addresses some marriage things, and he says, now concerning the uh, idols, see, in verse, chapter 8, and then he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, in verse chapter 12, and then he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, you see the continuity in that thought? that he very well could just be addressing some of the things that they had questions about or had written to him about, uh, and then he addresses these things. Now, regardless to whether that's the case or not, and it very well could be, Paul is definitely addressing, see, various things involving the church at Corinth, uh, like, for instance, the brother who had his father's wife, but he wants the entire brotherhood to be aware of these instructions. What's the point? See, you know, when Paul would write to the church at Corinth 
and tell them to put away this man who had his father's wife, well, what was, what was the churches at Rome to do? What were the churches in Judea to do if they had a fornicator among them? See, what was the church at Philippi to do if it had a fornicator? What would we do today if we had a fornicator among us? What are we to do? See, the instructions, although it would address the church at Corinth, the letter really was written to Christians in every place that call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And I say this to say, when I get over here to this uh, chapter 16 and these first four verses, see, I'm on alert that this may not necessarily be limited to just Corinth. And that's really the case, isn't it, Brother Hall? That when he writes to the church at Corinth, and he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, and then he mentions that he had given orders to the churches of Galatia, and he wanted them to do likewise, see, even so do ye, that uh, Paul wouldn't be an exhaustive here in, in who was to help. See, so these brethren who maintain that, one, it was just the churches of Galatia and Corinth that was to be involved in this work, See, and therefore we don't have authority today to take up a collection. That's really false on its face, really. Because that's not even how the Bible is written, and that's not how these instructions here are written. Now let me address that one real quick, that the churches here at Corinth, uh, the church at Corinth, excuse me, and these churches of Galatia uh, were the only ones involved. Well, I know better in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, for instance, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, and this is verse 1, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So Paul tells Corinth in this second letter, the Macedonians is involved too. They helping out on this. See? So if you come over here to Corinth and you just picture, uh, and incidentally, these parts of the, uh, these regions, they almost on opposite ends of the earth, <laughs> really. <laughs> that uh, now Macedonia and Achaia are on the same side, and uh, Tim would know more about this probably than any of us, but they on the same side over here, uh, Macedonia and Achaia down here where Corinth was in Achaia but these churches of Galatia is on the other side over here <laughs> they're on the other side on another continent see and so when Paul would write and say that I've given order to these churches over here and then I want y'all to do it too and then we find out that others were doing it too that ought to tell us something. It informs me that one, this list over here at Corinth is certainly, to say the least, at a minimum, it's not exhaustive on who helped, who took up a collection, and those kinds of things. I know there were other collections besides the collection and, uh, that the Corinthians were specifically told here to take up. That on the first day of the week, other groups were taking up these funds. See, these churches in Galatia, uh, each Sunday, and we'll get to that when we get to that section. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, see, up on the first day, really the idea is of every week, 
We'll address that when we get there. But they were sitting money aside. Now, the people that, uh, that argue, and we'll uh, discuss this in detail when we get there, that the, uh, this contribution somehow was to be taken up at home. When you read this, uh, these instructions, uh, and it seems like, you know, that he's telling them to store it up at home. See? And you can tell pretty quickly that that's not what he wanted. And uh, would some man in here tell us why we know that they wouldn't keep in this money at the house? Now, he says here in the text, anybody want to volunteer that? Yeah, that's right. He didn't want to have to go around uh, and have a bunch of collections. Boy, could you imagine uh, taking up a collection at Jerusalem? <laughs> Would it take you years, you know, house to house to get up over here? It's thousands of people, thousands of members. And Paul having to go around here and, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you got yours, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. He wanted to avoid that kind of uh, inefficiency, evidently, because he wanted it all put into uh, it, collections. See, it'd be done each week. Here's a collection. We took up one last week here, and I, I got mine. You probably brought yours too. We're going to do another one today. See, the, uh, collect, we're going to take up a collection today but we're going to store it up, though. See, that's what Paul's talking about. So if I come by, see, I can just get it. See, when we come by, we won't have to go door knock. We won't have to take up multiple collections, see. And he gives out these instructions. And so, what I contend is that these instructions, uh, when you examine them carefully, they really just a part of God's will as it relates to the contribution and to the treasury. And that's what we'll find as we examine uh, these verses carefully. See, now concerning, and so he's talking about these particular subjects, this, 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 and this, all Christians need to know about it. And then he tells Corinth, now concerning the collection for the saints, and we'll talk about that when we get there, who uh, was this money for? But I thought it, uh, it could be beneficial to us, see, to, to break this down into sections so we can really examine what collection, see, is he talking about? And I'd like us to raise that question now concerning the collection. See, I'd like us to ask that question. Which one? Because uh, I know that there were other collections. See? See, what I mean is I know that when he told the church at Corinth to take up one, I know the churches in Galatia were taken up uh, some, but then I find out that Macedonia was involved. But it's not just Macedonia. It's not just the churches at Corinth. It's not just the churches at Galatia because, uh, and I'd like to read this for us because uh, I believe this really here kind of puts in perspective when he says now concerning the collection for the saints, what he's really getting at here, see? That really, and I believe this, and I think I'll be able to prove this, that churches were uh, constantly taking up collections. See? That's why I raised the, when he says, now concerning the collection, what is he having reference to? See, I know for a fact that the church at Philippi uh, took up money and sent it to Paul.
He told this church here that. And while he was at this church at Corinth, I take it those first 18 uh, months, he might have come through some, but then first when he was working there, I know he said, I robbed other churches to do you service. So they took up a collection, but then when he writes to the church at Philippi, he says they took up money on more than one occasion. <laughs> See? So this notion that there was a collection, and then once they took it up, and then they, Paul comes through and gets it, there, there's nothing there's nothing going on as it he robbed everybody blind <laughs> took it all and uh, took it all over there to Jerusalem and the church couldn't help its widows <laughs> you know? the church couldn't help its preachers uh, I thought Paul told this church here I thought he told Corinth that y'all have every responsibility to support me to take up money and support me because he says if we have sown spiritual things for you is it a great thing if we reap your material things if others and here's what we mean brother Hall they had a collection besides this one here if others are partakers of this right over you Oh, wait a minute. So, all right. So he writes and says, take up a collection for the saints. Uh, I'm going to come by and pick it up. And then he writes in this same letter. He says, now y'all ought to be paying me. Now he didn't take it from them. But he showed them, boy, you should be. You ought to. I deserve it. Because the laborer is worthy of his hire. And he says if others are partaker of this right. See this right. That men who preach and work in the gospel have. At the works that they have. See these. Can you see the contribution there? for churches to aid these people, but it's, it's not a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. He's not suggesting that Corinth maybe could just help him out a little bit since he had uh, spent 18 years of his life in a real dangerous work environment and helping them out. He's not suggesting this and then he says, nevertheless, we've not used this right. Now he implies others had. See? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? And so we know, we're learning pretty quickly, aren't we, that uh Churches, in addition to these uh, collections Paul is discussing here, that what he wanted uh, is when he come by is uh, for them this money that's stored up, that's been put in the treasury, that he wanted to, see really is kind of set aside to help the needy saints. And we know that because they had other responsibilities, I mean, from this same letter. We don't have to go hunting. Right in this letter, they could see we need a collection. We got to have up some funds to help these pay these pre people that's working for us. The laborer is worthy of his hire. And we know that for a fact. And then, and let me get over here because this collection here, uh, 
was indeed a special collection in that it was uh, uh, mentioned here that Paul was going to come by and he tells them really in the second letter, but this information would have been out there, but they had an obligation to help people that had preached to them, people that had helped them. The Jews had helped them. See, Peter and them had helped them, sending men out, and they'd go out, and they'd, Paul would go out, and they'd preach people the gospel. And so when Paul would write to them in the second letter, he would remind them, you got an obligation here to help the brethren in need at Jerusalem. Here's how I know that. And we'll close with this. I think our first bell has rung, but I think this will help us really get a solid footing on. Now concerning the collection for the saints, see, that this isn't some, is that our second bell? That this isn't some uh, isolated incidents uh, no collections, no treasuries, just like these brethren, one of their contingency is just, this was just for Corinth and Galatia, and, and so why, where's the authority, uh, Rodney, for the uh, collection today? Why, why, what, what verse would you go to to show? Well, that's what I've been doing here, is just showing how silly that thought is, that I don't even have to get out of this book to show that they, they, they had to help preachers that worked for them, see? So if Paul come through and got all the money, <laughs> you know, and then, well, what about how would they help the, 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 these that took advantage of this right that they had by, while working at Corinth and helping them preach the gospel there among them? Where'd that, where would that come from? How would they get that money up? And we'll address all these things as we go, but I hope what's clear is that, one, uh, Paul isn't trying to be exhaustive here when he says uh, that I've ordered the churches of Galatia, that's all, and uh, I want y'all to do just like them, and that's it. To take it like that, see? That Corinth, you got churches of Galatia and Corinth mentioned here, that that's, no, that's baloney. Because I can go read in other places where uh, others were involved, but then what we'll start with, Lord willing, next week is that uh, all the Gentiles were told to help out. That's what we'll find. I appreciate y'all's time. If you have any questions about the collection or anything that we